I guess, I guess we can start. Um, as you may remember, we already talked about uh, permutation stability. Um, oh, I see that uh, Michael brought a new student to the to the seminar. Welcome. That's the youngest student we ever had here. Uh, so uh, we already had the last semester. Last semester we had about permutation stability. In and uh, um, in the next, uh, I think, three weeks, we are going to get uh, deeper into this. Uh, today, we'll hear about the connection with uh, invariant random subgroups. And in the next two weeks, I believe, we'll see how this can be applied to get uh, permutation stability. And I'm very glad to have uh, Henry Bradford uh, from Cambridge with us. We'll talk about uh, permutation stability and invariant random subgroups. Henry, the stage is yours. Okay, thank you, Alex, and thank you all for coming. Um, before I start with the maths today, I'd like to uh, say a word about uh, what a special day it is today, um, because of course it, it's my birthday, and uh, oh. I'd like to <laughs> thank, you in particular, since I'm speaking in America, the American people for collaborating over the last few months to get me such a nice present. Um, I had to bring one, I didn't know. <laughs> um, nothing I'm going to be talking about today is my own work. So this is um, a paper by Alex, Andreas and Oren um, that I've been particularly keen to understand. And as many of you know, the best way to understand something yourself is to teach it to other people. Um, let me know if there are any questions about what I say. In particular, since all three of the authors of the paper are here, I invite them in particular to shout out if I'm saying anything unfair or nonsensical at any point. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, uh, my title page should be visible. Yeah. Great. Um, Okay, so let me, I'm not assuming that, that, that you know what invariant random subgroups are, so let me start there. Um, so in, in the general framework, gamma is going to be a locally compact group. Um, throughout most of the talk, in fact, gamma is going to be a countable discrete group, but one can set up the theory in a slightly more general setting, and indeed people do. Um, we define sub gamma to be the space of all subgroups of gamma, which we turn into a Topological space using the Shabati topology. Uh, I won't say what that is in general, but in the main case we care about, which is countable discrete groups, this is just the uh, topology that you obtain by viewing um, the subgroups of gamma as a subspace of the space of subsets of gamma. And of course, we identify the subsets of gamma with uh, the product space, um, a two element discrete set to the uh, to the gamma. So the set of subgroups of gamma with a topology there. And this is a topological space on which gamma acts continuously by uh, conjugation. So it sends a subgroup to its conjugate. Then a random subgroup is uh, just a Borel regular probability measure on the space of subgroups. And an invariant random subgroup is a gamma invariant measure. So uh, gamma acts on the space of subgroups um, by Borel maps. Um, so for each element G of gamma, uh, we can define the push forward of a random measure by that element G. And um, we will call the random subgroup an invariant random subgroup or IRS if uh, that push forward measure is just the measure we started with, all elements of the group. We can also put a topology on the set of all invariant random subgroups um, of gamma, so the weak star topology. Um, and this topology turns the space I of IRSs of gamma into a compact, metrizable space. Okay, so it's 
Um, it's a fairly nice topological object. OK, let me give you some examples of invariant random subgroups. So the first and easiest example is normal subgroups give you invariant random subgroups. So a normal subgroup is just a, um, a fixed point of the action of gamma on the space of subgroups of gamma by conjugation. And so the Dirac mass at a normal subgroup is an IRS. Second, and in a similar vein, if I have any subgroup H of gamma, which has finite index, then the conjugacy class of that subgroup is finite. So I can take the um, uniform measure on the finite set of points, which is the conjugacy class of the subgroup H, um, and that will also be an invariant random subgroup. Slightly generalizing this, and this will be very important in the talk, I'll call an invariant random subgroup of gamma a finite index IRS if it's an atomic measure and it's supported on finite index subgroups. So if you like the, the ergodic finite index IRSs, are precisely um, uh, the IRS is coming in the example above, so the uniform measure on the conjugacy class of a finite index subgroup. And a general finite index IRS will be a potentially infinite uh, convex combination of, uh, of uh, such um, IRSs. Okay, in, in particular, they need not be finitely supported. Another example, which was an important part of the original motivation for studying invariant random subgroups is lattices. So this is the one occasion where I step outside the, um, necessarily step outside the setting of a, a discrete countable group. So if gamma is a locally compact topological group and L is a lattice in gamma, then um, the quotient space gamma mod L Admit, say, um, an invariant Borel probability measure. And the, um, the group gamma acts by conjugation on the set of conjugates of the lattice L. So it acts on the space of subgroups by conjugation. I focus in on the orbit of L under that conjugation action. So this gives you a map from gamma to the set of conjugates of L, sending G to GLG inverse. This map, of course, factors through the quotient space gamma mod L, because conjugation by L just sends L to itself. And therefore, this map from gamma to uh, the set of conjugates of L descends to a Borel map um, from gamma mod L to the space of subgroups of gamma, the image of which is, of course, just the set of conjugates of L. And because this is a Borel map, and because uh, by the fact that L is a lattice, we have an invariant probability measure on the quotient space, gamma mod L, we can push that measure forward to an invariant measure on the uh, space of subgroups. Namely, we can push it forward to an IRS of gamma. Um, so, Actually, one of the um, applications to which invariant random subgroups have been put in the past is um, precisely the study of lattices. So even if you were only interested in lattices for their own sake, um, it sometimes proved to be um, important to study invariant random subgroups in general. Um, the reason for that, as I said, is that the space of invariant random subgroups has extra structure, it's a, a nice compact topological space. So by passing from um, the set of lattices of a group to the space of invariant random subgroups, often one can prove things about that compact space and in particular prove uh, new results about the set of so-called lattice points of the space of IRSs. Um, this was the approach taken, for example, in the so-called Seven Samurai uh, paper, which is now quite famous. 
Okay, so um, so invariant random subgroups, in some sense, you can think of them as uh, generalizations and cousins of lattices, also generalizations of normal subgroups. The example of lattices is also instructive because it can be generalized in the following way. Because what did we use about um, the structure of lattices? Well, in this example, a lattice gave us a space with an invariant measure on which our group acts. And then we had a, a push forward measure that gave us an IRS. Well, we can do that same construction really for any Borel probability space X on which gamma acts um, by um, Borel maps, which preserve the, uh, the measure mu on X. So whenever we have such a situation, we can um, define a map from X to the uh, space of subgroups of gamma, which sends a point X to its stabilizer um, in gamma under this action. And this map sending a point to its stabilizer is a Borel map. And so we can push forward the um, the invariant measure mu on X to an invariant measure, namely an IRS on the space of subgroups. Okay, so this idea of taking a random stabilizer is also going to be very important in what follows. So much so that um, I'm just going to refer to the measure, the IRS obtained by this construction as the IRS associated to the, um, the gamma probability space X. So whenever I say the IRS associated to a space on which a group acts, this is what I mean. Uh, it's the random stabilizer IRS. And in fact, the random stabilizer is not only a powerful source of examples of IRSs, it's an entirely generic example in the sense that every IRS arises this way. So this was a theorem of um, Abbott, Glasner, and Virag um, from a few years ago. They proved that every IRS of a countable group can be obtained as the random stabilizer of some probability uh, measure preserving action of gamma. Okay, um, so that's a quick whistle stop tour through some facts about IRSs. Uh, any questions so far? No, okay. Um, let me push forward to permutation stability. So we've heard a lot about P stability in this uh, uh, seminar already uh, last semester. So I will be um, I'll be quite brief in talking about it here. Actually, um, can I ask a question? Since yes, I, please. Uh, I'm a big fan of Benjamini Schramm convergence. Are you going to yeah. relate the two at some point, or are you, are you finished with? Uh... Uh, so, so IRSs are going to come back, and Benjamini Schramm convergence is going to come in when they reappear. All right, I'll keep quiet. Okay, um, yeah, that's definitely coming. Um, okay, so um, so I, I'll, I'll skim over this a little bit, but my definition of P stability might be a little bit. Um, apparently a little bit different from uh, versions that we've seen earlier in the um, earlier last semester. Um, but hopefully it will be, it will at least seem plausible that what I uh, say is, is equivalent to the versions that we've seen before. So now we're going to be working and for the rest of the talk specifically in the setting of gamma a finitely generated discrete group. And moreover, I'm going to going to fix an epimorphism from a finite rank free group F onto gamma. So um, of course there are many such epimorph epimorphisms, but I'm gonna um, make a choice of one now and forevermore. So um, of course any action of gamma naturally induces an action of F via this epimorphism. So I'm going to, Okay, to define um, P stability, I'm going to consider um, if I have a pair of finite F sets, so if you like, of uh, finite um, edge regular edge labeled directed graphs, 
uh, with the same number of vertices. And I um, take a bijection between them as sets. I can ask the question of how far this bijection is from being, um, being an isomorphism of F sets. So um, whether it's equivariant with respect to the action. So I define the generator length of the bijection F to be um, a sort of count of um, how many places this fails um, to be an isomorphism of F sets, or if you like, an isomorphism of Schreier graphs. Um, so I take the normalized sum over all my uh, generators, my free generators of the free group, of the probability that a, a random point, um, uh, that at a random point X, the, um, the defining property of an isomorphism of um, F sets fails. So um, the uh, end point of the uh, S labeled edge leaving X is not mapped by F to the end point of the S labeled edge leaving F of X. So if that happens a lot, then these, this um, map F is far from being an isomorphism of F sets. And I'm going to define the generator distance between the F sets X and Y to be the minimal generator length of a bijection between the underlying sets. So possibly I, you know, I pick a bijection between them um, that is very far from being an isomorphism, but there's a better bijection I should have picked. So I say, okay, let's assume that I picked the best possible bijection and then I um, use its generator length as a measure of how far um, these F sets are from being isomorphic. Henry? Yeah? Uh, isn't it just isomorphism of labeled graphs? This is the way I should think of it? Yeah, exactly. So um, they're, um, these are graphs and the edges are labeled by elements of the free basis S. And of course, they have an orientation as well. So directed edge labeled graphs. Okay, um, so let me use this to define stability. So I'm going to say that a sequence, so I have my group gamma, remember, which is given to me as a quotient of X via a fixed epimorphism. So it could be that my F set is actually a gamma set. In other words, the action descends. That would be the same as saying that it's an F set at which every element of the kernel of pi, every element W of pi, uh, acts trivially on um, at every point. So if, if that happens, then the, the F set is actually also a gamma set. If that doesn't happen, um, we can define a weaker um, notion, which is what we'll call a stability challenge, which is that if you like asymptotically um, this uh, sequence of um, F sets tends to being a gamma set. So the probability when I take a random point in my finite F set that um, a given element W of the kernel of my epimorphism is a fixed point um, fixes that point, tends to one as n tends to infinity. Okay, so for, for any given fixed element of the kernel, the probability tends to um, one, although for different elements of the kernel, it might uh, tend to one at different rates. And then I say that a group gamma is p-stable if every stability challenge can be um, corrected to an actual sequence of gamma sets. So in other words, there is a sequence of gamma sets, um, Yn, such that Yn has the same number of vertices as Xn, um, such that the generated distance between Xn and Yn tends to zero. Okay, so, if you like, if we use the perspective of directed edge labeled graphs, um, 
the XN are directed edge labels of gra graphs which are not necessarily Schreier graphs for gamma, but we can move a few edges around um, to turn them into um, 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 Schreier graphs of gamma. Okay, so we, we don't we don't have to change them very much to correct them. And the main theorem, so, so the main result of the paper I'm talking about today, um, is that um, we can characterize p-stability for finitely generated amenable groups in terms of invariant random subgroups. So the result is that if gamma is finitely generated and amenable, then gamma is p-stable if and only if um, the finite index IRSs of gamma are dense in all IRSs of gamma. So if and only if every IRS of gamma is the weak star limit of finite index IRSs of gamma. Okay, so once again, remember that a, an IRS of gamma was called finite index if it was atomic and all its um, atoms were at finite index subgroups of gamma. Okay, so um, the group is stable if and only if every IRS is a limit of such finite index IRSs. And this is not just a theoretically very beautiful statement, it's also extremely useful in practice because people have studied IRSs of many of our favorite groups quite extensively and we know quite a lot about them. So this theorem is actually a very effective practical tool for determining whether or not a given group gamma is p-stable. So let me give some, oh, oh, so first before I proceed, um, you might wonder about how necessary this hypothesis of amenability is in the theorem. Um, it's certainly used in both directions of the proof in different ways. Um, in one direction, we know that the statement becomes false if we don't have some, um, if we uh, don't assume amenability. So the, an example that shows this is um, the group SL3Z. So this group satisfies uh, one side of the theorem. Every invariant random subgroup is indeed the weak star limit of finite index invariant random subgroups of gamma. This follows from the work of um, Stuck and Zimmer in the 90s, although I don't think they would have phrased um, the result in quite this way. So, this does have the required property on IRSs, but by uh, the work of Oren and Alex, which I think Oren talked about last semester, uh, this group is not p-stable, um, roughly speaking, because it's a property T group. We don't know um, if amenability is uh, a necessary condition for the other implication of the proof to be true. Um, it's an open question whether there is a p-stable group um, with the property that not every invariant random subgroup is the limit of finite index invariant random subgroups. Um, this has been asked um, for the um, for non-abelian free groups by Aldous and Lyons. So it's not known even for the free group whether every invariant random subgroup is the a limited finite index and very at random subgroups. In fact, it turns out that um, the answer to their question for the free group would be no, as soon as there is any p-stable group um, which admits an IRS which is not the limited finite index IRS. So they ask the question for the free group. You can ask the question for any p-stable group, and in fact, uh, um, a positive answer that, that there exists a p-stable group. Um, would give a negative answer to their question. All right, so let me, um, so I, I said that this theorem was a useful tool because we know a lot about invariant random subgroups and so we can use the theorem to determine p-stability of many groups. Let me give you some practical examples where the theorem has been applied. So first of all, in uh, the paper in which the theorem is proved, it's shown as an application that every polycyclic by finite group is p-stable. Also, every um, 
residually finite um, bounds like solitar group is p-stable. So this completes the classification of um, p-stability for the bounds like solitar groups uh, because we know that all of the bounds like solitar groups are sophic. Um, therefore, uh, the ones that are not residually finite um, are, um, are definitely not p-stable. And that leaves these ones, which um, uh, which can be proved by studying their IRSs, are p-stable. Um, next, uh, Tianyi Zheng um, classified the invariant random subgroups of certain um, groups acting on regular rooted trees, including um, the famous um, first group of Grigorchuk and the P groups of Gupta and Sivki. And she showed that um, indeed all their IRSs are the limits of finite index IRSs. Therefore, these groups are p-stable. Next, um, Alex, together with Ari Levit, considered um, invariant random subgroups of metabelian um, permutational reef product groups. Um, so they showed that if we have two finitely generated abelian groups, um, B and Q, given an action of Q on a set, omega, with finitely many orbits, we can form the um, permutational reef product. So this is the extension of Q um, by the direct sum of uh, omega many copies of B. And they proved that this um, uh, that this is also a, um, a p stable group um, again by uh, examining the IRSs of this group. Um, once again, it was it was already known that if the um, group B in this construction is not abelian, um, then the uh, Reith product is not residually finite. So um, all such um, so all um, um, uh, such amenable or indeed sophic uh, reef products with a non-abelian base group were already known not to be p-stable. Uh, but if the the base group is abelian, then they are p-stable under this um, under these conditions. So we have a good understanding of p-stability for reef products now. Next, the same authors use. Can I take you back to the previous slide? Sorry. Yeah. Um, so uh, my my Zoom session just crashed, but um, okay. I think uh, when you were talking about the uh, the second theorem, I mean these are not the only residually finite Baumstark solitar groups. You also ah, have a case of Baumstark solitar K K where k is like any integer. OK, yeah, yeah, OK. And these, are Sorry, not, right. these are not stable, although they are residually finite by uh, the work of Joanna. I see, OK. Uh, yes, yeah. Sorry. So that, so it, it's true to say that, the, that we have a full understanding of p stability for bams like solitar groups, but it uh, didn't come um, from this result directly. I mean, there was there was an extra ingredient needed. Yes, that's right. It, it came after that. It came that later. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you for the correction. Um, OK, so, um, so we have a classification of um, p-stability for BAMS like solitaire groups. We have a good understanding for reef products. The same authors in a separate paper also um, construct an uncountable family of pairwise non-isomorphic p-stable groups. So that was the first time this had been done. Um, so perhaps surprisingly, this shows in some sense that among finitely generated groups, p-stable groups are quite abundant. Um, so this, for, for those who know, this uncountable family is a um, construction um, due to Bernard Neumann um who um used it to give a i think the first construction of a an uncountable family of pairwise non-isomorphic um 
two generated groups. And um, um, indeed, it turns out that all the groups in his family are, um, are P-stable. Um, and again, this uh, result is obtained by studying their IRSs. Um, finally, um, I think the direction of using this result to prove that groups are not P-stable is less well developed. But there is one um, result I know from the paper um, that shows that it is also useful in that direction. So um, they give an example of a finitely generated group um, which is not P-stable but is weakly P-stable. And in fact, this group is finitely presented and uh, soluble. So um, weak P-stability, um, I think this was discussed last semester as well, but let me recall. Um, this is the condition of not requiring all um, stability challenges to be able to be corrected to um, gamma sets, uh, but only those that are uh, that are separating, if you like, those that come from um, actual sophic approximations of the group. Um, so, um, um, so it was asked by Agentsva and Parnescu in their paper where they um, formalized the notion of um, weak P stability and proved that um, Z cross Z is uh, P stable. Um, so they posed the question of whether a um, uh, there are any groups which are weakly P stable but not P stable. And um, studying IRSs again gives one the tools to uh, give such an example. Okay, so I hope that convinces you that this theorem is a, is a powerful practical workforce for um, determining whether an, an amenable group is, uh, um, is P-stable or not. And for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk about some ideas from the proof of the main theorem. So I won't be able to go into every nook and cranny, but my intention is at least to um, give you some sense of why the hypothesis of amenability is important in both directions of the theorem and what P-stability and invariant random subgroups have to do with one another. So once again, the theorem we want to prove is that a finitely generated amenable group is P-stable if and only if every invariant random subgroup is the limit of finite index IRS. And once again, let me recall um, that a group is stable if and only if every uh, stability challenge, which is a sequence of finite F sets, Xn, um, which asymptotically look like um, uh, gamma sets, if they can be corrected to a sequence of finite gamma sets, so a sequence sets Yn um, with the same number of vertices as Xn, at generate a distance from Xn tending to zero. So when such a sequence Yn exists for a stability challenge Xn, we'll call Yn a solution for Xn. Okay, so a group is P-stable if every uh, stability challenge uh, has a solution. Okay. Um, so let's dive into the proof. First, some preliminary remarks. Um, going back to invariant random subgroups, I want to note that um, the epimorphism pi from the free group F onto gamma induces an embedding of the space of invariant random subgroups of gamma into the space of IRSs of F. Because an IRS of F is an IRS, we can view it. Um, we can view gamma as an IRS of, we can view an IRS of gamma as an IRS of F by taking the pre-image of all the um, subgroups in its support under, um, under the epimorphism pi. So the IRSs of gamma can be viewed precisely as those IRSs of F, which, who supports, uh, who are supported on subgroups of F, which contain the kernel of the epimorphism. So 
um, I, you know, I, ha I have to be careful when I'm talking about um, IRSs of gamma being a limit of finite index IRSs, uh, that I specify that it's a limit of finite index IRSs of gamma rather than a limit of finite index IRSs of X. Uh, both concepts come up in the proof. So I'll call a sequence of finite F sets convergent um, if the sequence of associated IRSs is convergent in the space of IRSs. So once again, recall um, the associated IRS of um, a space on which a group acts, in this case, the free on which the free group acts, is the IRS that is obtained by the uh, random stabilizer con um, construction. Um, so when I have a, a finite F set, that is naturally an F probability space just by um, taking the uniform measure on the vertices. Um, so I can push that forward um, via the random stabilizer construction to an, um, um, an IRS on F. So that will be my mu N. And I just say that the sequence of F sets is, is convergent if that sequence of associated IRSs is convergent. And an easy compactness argument, the details of which I will not go into, um, tells us that when we want to check P stability of a group gamma, it's enough um, to consider convergent stability challenges for gamma. Okay, so um, the group gamma is P stable if and only if every convergent stability challenge in the book, the above sense, has a solution. And this, um, so once we've restricted the convergence stability challenges, this really allows us to build the link between um, um, stability and IRSs. So if I have a convergent sequence of finite F sets, so that has some limiting IRS in um, the space of IRSs of F, that convergent sequence of finite F sets is a stability challenge for group gamma if and only if that limiting IRS is in fact an IRS of gamma. So we have the IRSs of gamma living inside the IRSs of F. We have a sequence of finite F sets. We um, associate to that a sequence of finite index IRSs. We assume that that sequence of finite index IRSs converges in IRS of F. And we can ask whether the limit lies in IRS of gamma. And if it does, then um, the sequence Xn was a stability challenge for gamma. And that's an if known here. OK. Let's look at uh, one direction of the theorem. So let's suppose that every invariant random subgroup of our amenable group gamma is the limit of finite index invariant random subgroups of gamma. Um, well, we want to check, we want to prove that this group is P stable. So we take a stability challenge, which as I said on the previous slide, we can assume to be a convergent stability challenge. So the sequence of associated IRSs converges and because it's a stability challenge for gamma, the limiting IRS of the associated IRSs is an IRS of gamma. Well, um, this limiting IRS mu is an IRS of gamma, so that it is a limit of finite index IRSs in gamma. Okay, so we obtained it as the limit of finite index IRSs in F, um, which came from our stability challenge. And we produce another sequence of finite index IRSs, uh, now IRSs of gamma, which also converges to it. Now, doing a little bit of fiddling around with these finite index IRSs of um, gamma, the new N, we can assume that these new N actually are associated to finite gamma sets. Okay, so they're not just finite index, they're actually 
um, finite supported and they um, come from a finite gamma set via the uh, random stabilizer construction. And moreover, these um, finite set gamma sets Yn have the same number of vertices as Xn. Okay, so this Yn is going to be the a candidate uh, for a solution to the stability challenge presented uh, by XM. Uh, excuse me? Yeah. Uh, can you just quickly remind what is the difference between a uh, finite index IRS and the uh, support, finitely supported, like this, these? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Yeah. So um, the example, so, 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 the, so an ergodic finite index IRS is just the uniform measure on the conjugacy class of a finite index subgroup. Okay, so it's okay. just you take a finite index subgroup, all its conjugates, and if there are n of them, you hit each of them with probability one over n. Mm -hmm. A general finite index IRS is um, a potentially in infinite convex combination of such things. All right. Okay, so. We can very easily go from finite index IRSs to finitely supported IRSs because if it's an infinite convex combination, some of the uh, coefficients are going to be very small. So we just set those to be zero and modify the others slightly so it's still a probability measure. So that, that will be a finitely supported IRS, which is very close to our starting finite index IRS. All right, thank you. Yeah, and then we just need further modifications to you know, um, produce a finite gamma set from which that finitely supported IRS comes and uh, to control its size. Okay, so not, 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 none of those, you know, restrictions from a general finite index IRS to um, one coming from a finite gamma set of a specified size are very deep. They're just a little bit fiddly. Okay, so this is our candidate solution. The problem is it might not happen that Xn and Yn tend, um, tend to each other in generator distance. And this isn't just a, a hypothetical obstruction, it's an obstruction that can actually arise. Um, so let me give you an example of uh, this obstruction in practice. So if I took gamma to be the free group um, on a non-abelian finite rank free group on D generators, I can produce um, uh, two sets on which it acts. So um, I take finite quotients of the free group, so just, just finite groups, um, lambda n and delta m, and take their Cayley graphs. And so let Xn be uh, the Cayley graph of lambda n and Yn be the Cayley graph of delta m. I'm going to make some assumptions and I'm not going to justify that these assumptions can be satisfied, but um, um, you, I, I hope that either you have seen um, examples that convince you that these assumptions can be satisfied or you'll, um, you'll trust me that they can. I'm going to assume that lambda n has order double that of delta n. I'm going to assume that the sequence of Cayley graphs xn um, on lambda n with respect to the image of my uh, free generating set for gamma form an expander family. And I'm going to assume that both of xn and yn have large girth. So the girth both of them, that is the length of the shortest uh, non-trivial cycle in both of them, um, tends to infinity as n tends to infinity. In other words, um, asymptotically, xn and yn both locally look uh, like a, a 2D regular tree. They locally look like the Cayley graph of gamma. And okay, so one of them is a large girth Cayley graph, which is also an expander, such things exist. And the two sequences of finite graphs, finite gamma sets I produce, one is Xn, my expander family, and the other is two disjoint copies of Yn. 
Now, the point is that two, because this is two copies of uh, the same thing, so both halves have the same size, this is very far from being an expander family. Um, it has two fairly large connected vertex regions which are disconnected from each other, which tells you that in the generator metric, Xn and the disjoint union of two copies of Yn are far apart from each other. Right? You can't correct, you, you, you can't move a few edges around in an expander family to disconnect it. That's almost what an expander family is by definition. Um, so these things are, are far apart. There is no um, map of the vertex sets between them that is even close to an isomorphism of uh, directed edge labeled graphs. But because they both have large girth, um, they both have the same limiting invariant random subgroup, um, specifically because um, locally they um, asymptotically look like the Cayley graph of the three group. Uh, yeah, me, yeah uh, it's Peter again. Uh, so yeah. you're getting to Benjamin Schramm convergence. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. you're, you're... Uh, but here's where I'm a little unhappy. This, this yeah. girth assumption uh, makes trivial the issue of BS convergence. Mm -hmm. uh, and you seem to input that saying that this is an assumption which is not serious on why and anyway. Um, yeah, so all, all I require on why n is that its order is, um, is, is, you know, half or about, in, in fact, about half would do, but let's say exactly half of the order of the vertex set of xn, and the girth is tending to infinity. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm maybe not following. No there is no problem to arrange this. Uh, it doesn't even care if Yn is an expander or not. It takes oh, yeah. and, uh, But um, okay, I'm a bit confused. Usually, this is the whole issue. Like in the paper of uh, uh, Glasner et al. that you mentioned, where they they show various themes, uh, or even the seven samurai paper, they never assume any girth assumption. But you just want to, to build an example to show uh, you. Uh, oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, there's not yeah, a, so this, this is, right, this, this is, <laughs> I'm embarrassed, sorry, I, I yeah, no. So this is a deliberately toy example to show um, what this is leading to is why the assumption of amenability is important. So okay. here I'm working with a non-amenable group, if you like the easiest non-amenable uh, group. Okay, sorry, sorry. I, I was sort of thinking you're giving yeah. a proof. No, you just Yeah, didn't... sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, this is this is just just a counterexample when we step outside amenable groups. Um, so it's it's just contrived to show why um, having the same limiting IRS and converging in the generator metric are different. Um, okay. So the idea is that, um, th that, right, it wasn't a coincidence that to construct this counterexample, one of my families was an expander family. Um, so if I started with an amenable group, I couldn't construct such a counterexample. In fact, some extent, in some sense, such counterexamples are the only sort of obstructions that could arise. Okay, Henry? so, yeah. The reason for this obstruction is non-amenability or having property T or something like that? Um, so um, this is not, so we've got a free group here, so it's not a property T group. Um, yeah, so tau, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so it's not even a property tau group, but I can construct an expander family with respect to some sequence of quotients. Um, that's the point. So it's it's enough, right? It's enough that there is an expander family, more or less. Um, I suppose on finite Cayley graphs of even order, um, because this is the free group that it has lots and lots of homomorphisms to other groups. So I can arrange the, you know, the expander family that I um, can just pluck out of thin air arises as a um, sequence of quotient Cayley graphs of this group because it's the free group. Um, now, I could I could maybe do this with some groups other than the free group. The point is I wouldn't be able to do this if I started with gamma and amenable group. Okay. Thank you. So, okay, finally, we come to Benjamini Schramm convergence, uh, which I'm, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to um, touch rather lightly because it's a 
a big subject. So I'm not even going to define it very formally, but I'm going to say I'm going to introduce a new metric on finite F sets replacing D gen called D stat, um, which will bridge this gap between um, the distance between two sequences of F sets uh, tending to zero and the limiting IRS as being the same. So are you now explaining uh, how to overcome yeah, the fact yeah, that so X, distance X and Y and they weren't necessarily converging? They just yeah, exactly, exactly. So they weren't necessarily. It will turn out that if the group is, a, is amenable, they have to, and this will be the reason. Um, so, so this, yes, yeah, so I'm not going to define this very formally because um, I think if you've not seen this before, learning about it uh, for the first time 50 minutes into a talk about something else would just confuse you more. But if I have two um, finite F sets, X and Y, I say that they're close to each other um, if the um, if the statistics of balls in the triographs are similar. So what I mean by that is I pick a, a radius R and I imagine what um, a ball of radius R in the triograph of some group action might look like. And then I ask of my um, triograph X, what's the probability that if I pick a random vertex in X, the ball of radius R around that point will, look, will be isomorphic to the ball that I've dreamed up? Okay, and I, that, 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 that's some probability, it's between zero and one. If, if the ball that I dreamed up doesn't occur as a ball in my triograph, then the probability is zero. Um, if all um, balls of uh, radius R are isomorphic, as might happen in, say, a Cayley graph, then the, the probability is one. But so for any radius and any putative ball of radius R in a triograph, there is some probability that a random point in my triograph X will look like that. So that probability is a statistic of my triograph. And so for all radii and all possible balls, I have an associated statistic for X and I have an associated statistic for Y. So that gives you a two sequences, one for X and one for Y of numbers, statistics between zero and one. And I'll say that the triographs are almost the same if those lists of statistics are almost the same, um, where almost the same means I put some appropriate metric on um, on the space of sequences of numbers between zero and one, which generates the product topology. Okay, so um, um, so that was uh, a mouthful, but what it means is um, triographs in my um, balls in triographs of my uh, two um, actions look like a given ball with about the same probability. What I really want from this metric is the following two properties. First, convergence of um, two sequences of finite F sets in the stat metric is um, weaker than convergence in the generating metric. This should seem plausible because if Xn is just yn with a few errors, then most balls in xn are not going to contain any errors. They'll just look like corresponding balls in yn. So a given isomorphism type, the only thing that can contribute to differences in the probability of getting a given isomorphism type of balls is um, those balls that contain the errors, differences. And if those are very few, then the statistics will be similar. Second, um, this, cover, this metric covers the gap between um, convergence of the IRSs and um, uh, convergence of the uh, distance between the sequences of finite F sets to zero. So if the associated IRSs of the two sets um, 
uh, mu n and nu n, they converged and their convergent sequences, finite f sets, they converge to the same limiting IRS if and only the statistical difference between the finite f sets tends to zero. Okay, and this, the key technical result is that um, if the group gamma is amenable um, and we have two sequences of f sets with the same number of vertices, uh, sorry, if we have a sequence of f sets xn and a sequence of gamma sets yn with the same number of vertices, then we can upgrade distance tending to zero in the statistical distance to distance tending to zero in the generator distance. So property one said that in general, um, convergence in generator distance is at least as strong as convergence in statistical distance. This tells us that um, if we're dealing with um, one sequence of the F sets being trigraphs of an amenable group, then we can say the converse. Okay, so I'm going to treat this theorem almost like a black box, um, which is a little bit unsatisfactory. I will say a little bit more about where it comes from, um, which um, if you're familiar with the theory that underpins uh, the proof of this theorem will ho hopefully be enlightening. Um, but if you're not, it will seem like I'm just explaining this black box in terms of another black box. So I apologize for that. Um, the key here is the key concept is hyperfinite families of finite graphs. So um, the point is that if I have a sequence of finite trigraphs of an amenable group, then they form a so-called hyperfinite family. So this is where the amenability is being used. And hyperfiniteness is a kind of negation of expansion. So it runs in the opposite direction. So a family of finite graphs is hyperfinite if for every epsilon greater than zero there exists a positive number k such that in every graph in the family there's a finite set of vertices containing less than an epsilon proportion of the vertices such that if I remove those vertices then I decompose my graph into um, graphs of bounded size, size at most k. Okay, so um, I can remove an arbitrarily small proportion of the vertices of any graph in my sequence, uh, provided those vertices I remove are carefully chosen, and turn my graph into a disjoint union of graphs of bounded size, it's bounded across the whole family of finite graphs. So in some sense, such a family of graphs is very far from being an expander family. So it, they're very much unlike the, um, the counterexample that I gave above coming from the free group. Um, so you can't produce such counterexamples using quotients of amenable groups. And the sort of key technical input to proving that we can upgrade convergence in statistical difference to convergence in generator distance is um, a theorem of Newman and Solar who showed that, who showed sort of the analog of the statement that, um, that I want for abstract undirected um, um, unlabeled graphs of bounded vertex degree where one of the families is hyperfinite. For example, a sequence of trigraphs of an amenable group. So they prove that if you have two such sequences of um, uh, finite graphs, bounded degree, same number of vertices, if one of them is hyperfinite, then statistical convergence implies generator convergence. Okay, I'm being a little bit naughty here because I'm introducing without defining them statistical convergence and generator convergence in a different category, namely the category of um, undirected, unlabeled um, finite graphs rather than um, 
directed edge labeled finite graphs but um hopefully one can imagine what what the appropriate notion might be and okay to get from this result about graph theory to a result about group actions uh, we need an extra ingredient which was contributed by um or inspired by work of Gabor Ellick, which allows us to um, encode um, directions on edges and edge labels um, into uh, finite, undirected, unlabeled graphs. Okay, um, any questions about this? I know that I'm hiding a lot of things up my sleeve, but does, does this at least give an, I hope this at least gives an overview. Okay, um, just to finish, I'll say a quick word about the other direction. So, so, so that um, really concludes the proof that going from um, every IRS being a limit of finite index IRS has proved that the group is stable because we, we could upgrade uh, convergence in statistical metric to convergence in generator metric. And therefore, our sequence YN actually was a solution to our stability challenge, so our group was stable. Going the other way, if I assume that my group is amenable and p-stable, I want to show that every IRS is a limit of finite index IRSs. So take an IRS. Um, how will we produce finite index IRSs? Well, the first step is to recall by the result I mentioned of Arbit, Glasner and Virag that we can assume that our arbitrary IRS arises from the random stabilizer construction. So there is a Borel probability space X on which gamma acts by um, measure preserving transformations whose associated IRS is our IRS mu of gamma that we started with. Now, again, we're going to use the fact that our acting group gamma is amenable. So if I take the, the orbit equivalence relation on this Borel space X, so the equivalence classes of this equivalence relation, which I'll call E, are just the orbits of gamma acting on X, then because gamma is amenable, I can apply the um, famous result of Ornstein and Weiss, which says that um, up to erasing a null set of points in X, so by restricting to a gamma invariant po-null, um, that is full measure, Borel subset of X, um, and restricting the equivalence relation E to that subset, I obtain an ascending union of Borel equivalence relations with finite equivalence classes. So this is also referred to as a, as a hyperfinite equivalence relation, slightly meet, different meaning of the term hyperfinite, but this equivalence relation up to neglecting a small number of points is the ascending union of um, Borel equivalence relations with finite classes. And I'm going to be very um, impressionistic about this step, but the idea is that these finite Borel equivalence relations allow us to cook up uh, finite index invariant random subgroups, not of gamma, but of F, which uh, converge to our original IRS mu. Okay, so using this, the, the hyperfiniteness of this equivalence relation, we can't necessarily um, prove that mu is the limit of uh, finite index IRS in gamma, but we can prove that it's the limit of finite index IRS in F. And then the, uh, the point will be that we can use P stability to upgrade the, um, to replace these, um, finite index IRS in F with finite index IRS in gamma. So once again, um, these finite index IRF, we can slightly modify such that they actually come from um, the random stabilizers of finite F sets. 
that's not a big deal. And because the limiting IRS is an IRS of gamma, that means that these phi F sets are a stability challenge for gamma, which by P stability, we can correct to a solution. So a sequence of uh, finite gamma sets. These finite gamma sets also have invariant random subgroups associated with them. These invariant random subgroups have to be a finite index because they're associated to finite um, gamma sets. And the second sequence of finite index IRSs also converges to mu um, because the, um, well, I, I, I suppose in, in terms of the language of the previous part, the generator distance tends to zero, therefore the statistical distance tends to zero uh, therefore, the limiting IRS is the same. Okay, and so, um, as I promised, p-stability lets us um, upgrade uh, being a limit of finite index IRSs in the free group to being a limit of finite index IRSs in gamma. All right, that's all I wanted to say. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, really. I was uh, thinking for myself, how will you be able in uh, one talk to include all this? And it's, it gave a very excellent picture. I wish, I, uh, I, I, I maybe should ask your permission to use your slides for my talks, or maybe better, I should stop to give talks on that and send people to listen to that because it was recorded. That was really uh, very nice. Thank uh, you very much, Alex, that means a lot. Uh, questions? Are there are there are there questions? Just I cannot see you, so please just speak if you if you want to talk. Uh, yeah, and I will continue screen sharing in case people want to refer to slides. So I also won't be able to see you for the time being. Um, since uh, I asked, I'll continue with my only question. Um, you explained how you used uh, uh, Benjamin Schramm. Can you maybe say a few words about the relation between other uh, other relations between uh, IRS and Benjamin Schramm? So Benjamin Schramm is a very clear notion of convergence in the statistical sense that you described. Yeah. Uh, and in the Seven Samurai paper and so on, they use these things, but maybe for people who haven't thought about these things, is, is there some uh, deeper connection between these notions? Um, I don't know about a deeper connection. So I didn't actually say, I, I didn't actually justify um, what the um, connection between Benjamin Schramm convergence and um, having the same limiting IRS was. And the reason for that is not really deep at all. Um, remember that convergence of invariant random subgroups is convergence in the weak star topology, which means you, you know, you, you integrate some functions with respect to the measures and, and check that the limit of those uh, integrals is what you want it to be. Um, because of the topology on the space of subgroups, it's sufficient to integrate with respect to indicator functions of certain special test sets. Um, so the test sets really are just um, interrogating how the subgroup intersects with the ball. So I take the ball of radius R in my group and I um, dream up a subset of it and my I, I can produce a clopen set of the space of subgroups consisting of those subgroups whose intersection with the ball is the set I dreamed up. Now, that's almost the same as, um, in fact, it is the same as the ball in my Schreier graph looking like yeah. a certain ball that I've dreamed up. Mm -hmm. um, so convergence of the measure, i.e. the probability that a intersection of my subgroup with the ball looks a certain way, 
is the same thing as convergence in the probability of um, a ball and my trigraph working the same way, which is the way I defined or described Benjamini SRAM convergence. Um, so that's not a kind of that, that's a very shallow way in which it connects, but hopefully it makes the point that this is not a kind of surprising link between these two worlds. It's, it's really just the definitions unpacked carefully enough. That helps. Yeah. And happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, uh, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask about the example of SL3Z as for one of the directions failing when you do not assume an inability. Uh, yes. I just wanted to ask whether there are more examples for such groups or specifically like groups without property T and which demonstrate such behavior. Um, so um, I guess the question would be let's let's try and think of other non-amenable groups um, where the IRSs are restricted in this way. Um, and the question of whether we can find such a group without property T, um, would something like SL2, uh, some people in the audience might be able to tell me, but would something like SL2Z1 over P work? Because that has the congruent subgroup property. So maybe we know something about the IRSs. Mm. Or does or does that example have other IRSs than the finite index? I mean a product in the two one one groups, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's probably the stack zimmer. I, if I remember correctly, the stack zimmer applies to them. Okay. So, po so possibly, but I'm not completely sure. I don't remember. That. Okay, but but that might be a candidate, and that doesn't have property T. Um, hmm. I guess maybe we ooh, we probably also haven't determined whether that example is P stable though. But you probably can cheat. You know, you can take uh, maybe SL three Z cross Z. Uh, okay, yeah, one could do that as well. That would be a little bit of cheating, maybe alone meant more interesting examples, but... Yeah. Um, so, okay, so, yeah, so that, that, that's a way you can produce other, other things. Um, so, so I, I, yeah, I propose SL2Z1 over P, but I can't pr prove that it's a counterexample. Okay, thank you for the talk, too. Thank you. If, if there are no more questions, I just want to make two remarks. One, uh, you mentioned at the very beginning that sometimes it's, uh, even if you just want to study lattices, then uh, it's better to go to the IRSs. There is a little paper which is not so known of uh, Tsachi Gelander, which I, I think it's very beautiful. He showed the old results of Kashdan Margulis about lattices with mm -hmm. a much um, kind of uh, uh, shorter proof by, by using IRSs. It's uh, appeared recently, I think, in the volume in honor of uh, Kashdan birthday, but uh, it, it, I think it maybe didn't make enough noise, but I think it's very beautiful. And the second remark is that next week and the week after we will see some applic more uh, applications of this uh, and so next week we have uh, Ari Levit at the same day the same time and uh, see you all and uh, again uh, happy birthday Henry and thank you very much thank you for having me I've enjoyed it very much <laughs>